Hi guys. I appreciate you hanging in there as we uh, move on through Peruvian Plunge where we find ourselves still encased in the Manu Learning Center on the banks of the Mother of God River figuring out how uh, this tangled web is going to continue to be weaved weaved woven so we are now at chapter 24 the rocky path to salvation yep 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 uh, okay and it is now this is going to be the weekend of july 11th and 12 2009 it away still at the Manu Learning Center <clears throat> I divided the balance of my stay at Manu Learning Center between the orchid garden and the gazebo playing the role of periodista journalist by day and invisible man by night though I didn't push my luck behind the privacy of my cucaracha net again on Saturday, I was paid a rare visit by none other than Joaquin Rivers himself. This being the second and final visit during my nine-day stay, Joaquin was there to remind me that my $10 per day trial period was winding down and that we needed to discuss my future at Manu Learning Center. Again, I offered to trade work in the bio garden or my services as press agent at Chris or English lessons for the staff for the reduced rate. <clears throat> Unlike Elizabeth Vargas from Cusco, he wasn't falling for my bullshit. Instead, he reminded me of the CREA's scholarship application he had mentioned in Cusco amid all the wink, wink, nudge, nudging. Only this time, the winks and nudges had morphed into a helpless, open-handed shrug. It's really out of my hands. I'm just one more guide on the board. Just do your best filling out the application and we'll see what happens. Translation, you have about as much chance of being awarded a $10 per day scholarship, you cheapskate freeloader, as you have of winning the Irish sweepstakes. Both of us wanting to avoid an embarrassing situation, we continued to play the mind game with the foregone conclusion. He produced the absurd, in my, in my case, scholarship application, which was clearly intended for biologists doing research on rainforest ecology and had nothing whatsoever to do with crusading environmental journalists hoping to, hoping to kick big oil out of the mother of God. <clears throat> more to entertain myself than to attempt to win a scholarship that I had a zero chance of winning, I answered the dozen questions the best I could. Here's just a sample of what I wrote when asked what the result, what the expected results would be for my project. My hope is that my book will marshal support to combat the oil and gas explorations plans by Hunt Oil, which, if they go through, could seriously undermine the work being done by Kriez at Manu Learning Center. <clears throat> Joaquin and I should hear back from the board within five days. Nine days later, when I returned to clean the rest of my shit out of Manu Learning Center, I had received no response, coincidentally enough, no response. Coincidentally enough, the day after all my stuff had been removed, I received a short email from Joaquin saying my application had, unfortunately, been denied. Drifting off to sleep on a rainy, surprise, surprise, Sunday night, I had no idea what adventure lay in store next for me. All I knew was that the next day I would be heading back across the Mother of God River to salvation to see what spirit 
would put in my path next. Which brings us to Monday morning, July 13th, 2009. <clears throat> my first problem to deal with on that gray Monday morning was my second bag of cannonballs. All that wink-winking and nudge-nudging on Joaquin's part in Cusco, combined with all the wishful thinking on my part, had lulled me into believing I had a sure thing home on such a half-baked odyssey, and I had foolishly dragged all of my worldly possessions to Manu Learning Center with me. With no other choice available, I stashed my less important valuables in a corner of the office and hurried off to catch up with the band of BioGarden Ecotiers who were bound for salvation to build their second BioGarden number 8. Assuming no others had been bulldozed for houses or pavement or tennis courts or helicopter landing pads, I caught up with them just as they were boarding the pecky pecky that would carry us over the swift waters of the Rio Madre de Dios. As is always the case, it was a longer and rockier path from the Mother of God to salvation than I had anticipated. An hour-long, two-mile trudge made even more miserable by the fact I was wearing plastic flip-flops while all the other folks half my age carrying half my weight were dressed in sturdy boots. The Pecky Pecky had delivered us from the lodge to the beach across the main river channel, but I did not realize until ten minutes into the trudge that the other side of the Mother of God was in fact an island, and we still had to cross another channel of the river before reaching the mainland. We arrived at a knee-deep rocky ford, a pain in the ass, but by no means an insurmountable obstacle, when a heated discussion broke out between one of the young volunteers, the stoner from Ireland, and our native guide, Romero, who just happened to be Ramon's brother. Romero, an Amazon native who had lived in the area for his entire life, insisted there was a better place to cross downstream. The young Irishman, who had been in the area for about two weeks, insisted that he knew the river better than our native guide and that this was the best place to cross. Over the stringent protest of the young Irishman, the rest of us put our money on Romero and began following him like baby ducks struggling to keep up with Mama. The trail soon evaporated into a boggy morass of sandal-sucking quicksand, and it was all I could do to keep from pitching forward under the oppressive weight of my bag of cannonballs. Onward we trudged down the island to God the island to God in Romero only knew where, following a fresh trail of jaguar tracks through the wet, gooey sand and mud, which was growing deeper and deeper. Throughout the walk, the young Irishman's protest grew more shrill that we were going the wrong way and that we needed to turn back. Finally, we reemerged at the channel we had left 15 minutes earlier at the spot that Romero was so sure was a better place to cross. As you, as you probably have figured out, it was an impassable, chest-deep, muddy pool of water, no doubt with three feet of quicksand at the bottom of it. Spirit tapped me on the left shoulder. You might want to pay attention to the fact that this dude is the big brother of your guide to the ruins. A genuinely befuddled Romero stared uncomprehendingly at the dead end he had just led us all to. I'm sure this was the best place to cross, he stammered. Perhaps we should return to the first crossing. We all turned back around and retraced our muddy tracks back across the island to the knee-deep rocky ford where we had started. It sucks to be right all the time, the young Irishman groused. It's such a burden to carry through life, knowing you're right and not being able to convince anybody else. The other 
folks were getting sick and tired of the guy's bitching, though I sympathize with him having known the burden of being right all the time myself for almost 50 years, I thought I would lighten the mood with a hambone witticism. I know just what you mean, dude, I said. I thought I was wrong once, but I was mistaken. That got a few weak laughs, but it was clear that half the folks were still ready to feed the guy to the Jaguar that had made those tracks just a few hours before, so I kept my mouth shut with what I really wanted to say to the young Irishman, which was this. If you were that fucking sure you were right and you knew that was the best place to cross the river, then why the hell did you even follow Romero and the rest of us? Why didn't you stick to your damn guns and cross the river? I didn't need to waste my breath because I knew the answer to my rhetorical question. The guy did not cross the river because everyone else in his tribe, even though he knew they were taking a wrong course of action, was going to leave his ass behind and alone if he didn't go along with the group think, as wrong as it was. It was a tiny example of how this whole planet has gone completely astray in its global groupthink. Even those awakening souls who are figuring out this fact, the gargantuan ta task of convincing the global tribe of the error of their ways, which is why so many of them throw in the towel after a few failed attempts to turn the tide and instead just follow the lemming masses over the cliff. Anything, even death of a planet, beats the hopeless feeling of being abandoned by one's tribe. Believe me, I know how these defeated chicken littles feel. It is the single most demoralizing aspect of this entire fool's journey I've been on for the past seven months. We returned to the Rocky Ford, which took all of two minutes to cross and continued on our stony path back towards salvation. As I stumbled along in my flip-flops over the loose sharp rocks, cussing my bag of cannonballs and slapping at sand flies, I thought more about what the young Irishman had said about the burden of being right all the time. My mind drifted back to a buddy of mine from South Austin, a lovable sweetheart of a guy, but unfortunately, a lovable sweetheart alcoholic whose drinking problem was well known, was well known to but rarely mentioned by all his friends. In April of last year, my friend, using the inheritance money of his father who had recently died, bought a motorcycle. I was horrified. The guy couldn't stand up on two feet after midnight, much less stay up on two wheels. Dude, you either quit the damn booze or get rid of that bike, I told him in no uncertain terms. If you don't, you will be dead in six months. He waved me off with an invincible smile and a ham bone. You're such a fucking drama queen look. I get so often from friends and foe alike. I told the same prediction to his fiancée, a nurse who worked at a head injury hospital in the vain hope that maybe she could talk some sense into the fool, but she was in denial as much as he was, though she at least wore a helmet when she was on the back of the bike. Every time I saw them heading off into the night, leaving a bar, I wondered if that would be the last time I would see my friends alive. Four months later, my friend was dead, returning home after midnight, drunk off his ass after getting shit-faced with another wasted buddy of mine. He had slammed his bike into the back of a parked pickup truck almost within sight of his house. Thank God his fiance, his fiance was not on the back or she would probably be, be dead too. Call me Nostradumus. 
Guys, I am every bit as convinced that this planet is driving a motorcycle at 90 miles per hour down a dead-end street with a blood alcohol level of about 8% as I was that my buddy had less than six months to live if he didn't quit the booze. As a society and as a species, we are drunk off our asses in denial that our behavior from our breeding like flies to our unquenchable thirst for little planet-eating plastic baubles that we think are going to make our spiritually empty lives so complete is not going to come back on us and bite us in the ass like it did my friend. I can see it as clearly as the words on this paper, yet I cannot, as hard as I try, turn these words into the tiniest bit of action on the part of anyone reading them. So, what do I do? Keep fording the mother of God on this lonely fool's journey down here in the jungle and finding my ass alone at the end of every day? Or go back to South Austin and pick up the partying where I left off till the world implodes under its own bloated, unsustainable weight? Just as I was about ready to, uh, my computer is jammed again. Uh, good Lord, guys, I am uh, sorry about this. Uh, I do not understand why the down scroll button on my computer doesn't work. Anyway, where were we? Just as I was about ready to set up camp on the side of the rocky path until a Hunt Oil helicopter could come, could come save my overburdened, flip-flopped old fart gringo ass, of course, had I been on my pipe dream, dream hike to the mythical Inca ruins, we barely would have broken a sweat from the day's adventure, we stumbled onto the deserted highway leading to Salvacion, miraculously two minutes after collapsing into a sweaty heap of sore bones and cannonballs on the side of the road, I was rescued by the morning bus from Shintuya, which carried our motley crew of gringos the three miles into town. In the seat next to me sat an Indian woman who could have been 28 or 52 holding a bizarre hand-carved wooden object in her lap that looked all the world like a toy boat. I studied the Stone Age carving furtively from the corner of my eye. What could that thing be? A Stone Age musical instrument to go with my pagomi? Some primitive form of planting tool, perhaps? With our bus stop in sight, I plunged across the cultural canyon that divided our two seats and our two lives and asked the woman what that strange object was. It's a toy boat, you stupid gringo. What the hell do you think it is? She replied, replied shyly, then turned her face away from me to stare out the window. Our first priority upon hitting town was to check into our hotel, the very hotel called the Shayla, where I was holing up when I had been blasted out of Salvacion by the sonic boom of the American stars six weeks earlier and had figured I would never see again in my life. I've been through this movie already, I groused at spirit. Why are you dragging me back to this damn place in the middle of this filthy town? She just smiled back at me, shooting me one of those inscrutable, you'll find out soon enough, Hambone, looks. This time around, I chose the $4 per night shared bathroom option. I tossed my bag of cannonballs on the sagging mattress in the upstairs corner room and hurried downstairs to meet up with a gang of bio garden volunteers. 
as we milled around in the small courtyard, I just happened to casually glance through the open door of the downstairs corner room, where my eyes were speared by a sight that ultimately may prove to be the death of me. I will pick up the rest of this story in the next chapter. Somewhere between my flabbergasted astonishment at what I was looking at, my email addiction, and my rumbling belly, I had managed to miss breakfast while dealing with my second bag of cannonballs that morning. I let the crew of young eco-tears slip away from me under assurances by the arachnophobic medical student Hippocrates that We'll be just a couple of minutes from here, down below the school. Can't miss us, dude. Even though there were eight of them and eight hours of light left in the day, I knew from 25 years of experience building organic raised bed gardens that to even approach the manicured perfection of Manu Learning Center's prototype bio-garden would take these well-intentioned but know-nothing neophytes the balance of Monday and half of Tuesday to finish. Ninety minutes later, I set out on my two-minute stroll to the work site below the school, which was directly across the street from the hotel. Another 90 minutes later, after asking two dozen dumbstruck Peruvian villagers where I might find a gang of eight shovel-wielding gringos building a garden in their midst and taking my maiden hair-raising flight back and taking my maiden hair-raising flight on the back of a genuine made-in-China Peruvian moto-taxi in my desperate search for my comrades, I finally found them, putting the final touches on Salvacion's newest bio-garden, compliments of the Cries Foundation. That's right. Barely three hours into what should have been minimally an eight-hour construction project, the proud troop of neophyte organic gardeners were congratulating themselves on a job well done in their noble effort to keep the Amazon rainforest green and environmentally sustainable. Choking back a bubbling hydrant of hambone psychic puke, which, believe me, was tougher than holding down a gallon of San Pedro juice, I surveyed the dismal little garden in front of me, looking for one slim thread of connection between it and its loamy, manicured prototype across the river. There was no connection. Perhaps I was just confused as to the definition of the word prototype because everyone else seemed quite satisfied with their relaxed definition of bio-garden. According to the kids in front of me, a bio-garden would be defined as follows. A hodgepodge collection of three or four table-sized areas of rough dug untilled wet clods of clay surrounded by three-inch high stone borders. As far as I could tell, zero effort had been made to double dig the raised beds. I usually dig my beds at least four times. To break up the softball sized clods of clay or add one ounce of compost or other organic matter. There was a small mountain of sawdust from the murdered trees at the sawmill a five-minute walk away from the garden construction site. It goes without saying that bells and whistles such as, I don't know, drip irrigation, ground cloths, or even mulching against weeds, drainage culverts, rain protection, shade cloths, trellises, etc. had even been considered much less constructed. 
I saw nothing to qualify these sad little mud pits as gardens, much less bio gardens, with or without chemical fertilizers and pesticides, which I can guarantee you the proud owner of this bio garden will use on the hair thin chance that she even attempts to ever plant the first seed, this garden will be an utter hopeless failure that will not produce enough vegetables organic or otherwise, to feed a cricket breakfast. As a former professor of organic gardening, which I am, who carries around the heavy burden of being right all the time, I give Crayes a D minus. They ought to be ashamed of themselves. The nonplussed heiress to this three hours of wasted effort by the eco-tiers a dazed and confused young woman clutching a four-year-old yard ape already gleefully sizing up the beckoning mud pits for their per potential as toy soldier battlegrounds seems generally pleased by their handiwork, clearly a sign she had no clue how to garden. Her only a request both reasonable and re unreasonable at the same time, was that the volunteers line the muddy paths between the muddy beds to keep her floor scrubbing duties to a minimum. At this point, my ham bone outrage over this whole pointless effort bubbled over and took misdirected aim at the poor woman who is supposed to be benefiting from the garden. Why can't she line the damn paths herself, I blurted out. Is she helpless? Isn't the whole point of exercises like this to help these people to become more self-sufficient and let them take over from there? But she has a child, one of the female volunteers pointed out in classic breeder speak, as if that was supposed to mean anything. Apparently, the choice to have children renders women helpless in every other area of their lives, as far as I could tell by this trite argument. Fine, then the little fucker can help her line the damn paths, I said. It might teach him some damn personal responsibility and not to sit around waiting for some damn gringo to come do everything for him, which is all this effort is teaching the kid. I just can't help it, guys. It's time to get this fucking revolution and consciousness moving, starting with the four-year-olds before we lose them to the idiocracy holding this planet hostage. A tension-filled silence brought about by the mere suggestion that these folks could start taking some fucking personal responsibility for the muddy mess they've gotten themselves into, with or without help from gringos, settled like a fog of chemical pesticide over the festive atmosphere. The tension was broken by Hippocrates, who no doubt realized, consciously or not, that this entire wasted effort was a total sham. This is a democracy here, and my vote is that this garden is finished, and that we all now retire to the lake, Hipp Hippocrates stated gallantly. Since nobody challenged the Democratic one-vote decision, we headed off towards Machuwasi. We hadn't gone three blocks before the leader of our raggle-taggle band, who I think was a Crea's employee and not just a volunteer, and I got into an argument over which was the correct path to the lake. I insisted it was time to turn left, while she insisted we were to go straight. As we were arguing the point, an old Indian woman entered the fray and sided with me, which, after our earlier adventure, meant nothing. The standoff continued. Fine, I said. You guys have fun on your little adventure to nowhere. I'm going to the lake. I turned left and started down the road alone. Thirty seconds later, the gang fell in behind me. Ah, it was great to be back. 
at Machuasi, the little lake I remembered so fondly. Paddling our little huck fin raft across the pond, I could, I could already feel the weird Manu Learning Center vibe beginning to recede, and we saw more wildlife in 30 minutes than I had seen in nine days across the river. Arriving at the other side of the pond, I climbed the tower for a two-minute bird survey and was ditched by my young companions. Just as well, they were starting to grate on my nerves the same way I had been grating on theirs for the past week. I was less than overjoyed to discover that I had company at the tower. Emilio, the surly caretaker of the lake whom I had inadvertently insulted at the Grand Fiesta six weeks earlier by politely declining to share a 55-gallon drum of beer with him. I nodded to him politely and just to make small talk reminded him that I had been to the lake before. I know who you are, gringo, he growled, rooster strutting up to me and shadow boxing in my face. I almost beat your ass at that dance. I was very drunk. <clears throat> Subtly changing the subject, I asked Emilio, Emilio, who I discovered to my great surprise was the vice mayor of Hunt Oil Friendly Salvacion, Peru. His opinion of the impending invasion of an army of petroleros who intended to build their base camp and main heliport about a half mile from where we were standing, I was pleasantly surprised by his answer. No es bueno, the vice mayor replied. When those helicopters get here, you won't see a bird left here at Machuasi. He pantomimed a little flapping motion with his hands, indicating a bunch of terrified birds fleeing for their lives from the helicopters and disappearing across the Mother of God. It was downright touching to see such a badass tough guy so concerned about the welfare of a bunch of little birds. It almost gave me hope for my stalled revolution. The talk about Hunt Oil got me itching to get back to town. I was relieved to see my young companions returning so I could paddle us back across the lake to the trail into salvation. I was thinking about what I had seen in that hotel room directly be below my own room at the Shayla. It was time to get this revolution in gear. I had things to do and important people to talk to in Salvacion, Peru. And that winds up chapter 24 and brings us to the longest and most important chapter of the book, chapter 25, Inside the Mind of a Planet Eater. Coming right up. Bye, guys.